So um, welcome everybody to London Vegans. For those that don't know, we have generally we have a meeting on the last Wednesday of every month um, here on Zoom. We're also on a meetup. So some of you may have found us from the meetup group. We stream live most of our meetings to the London Vegans Facebook group. So welcome if you are watching us on the Facebook group. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for the month. Um, uh, Varsha Sanegi, I've known for quite a while. Um, I think she actually came, came to speak to us uh, maybe three or four years ago, I think. Um, um, Varsha's a medical herbalist. She's going to give you a bit more information about that in a few moments' time. Um, the title of the talk I've done is um, Herbal Immunity and Tinctures. So um, without further ado, let me hand over to Varsha. Thank you for coming to speak to us. Thank you, Brian. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you again. Uh, I think it was 2016 that I came to speak um, in central London uh, with you guys. And it was a really good experience, lovely food we had as well. So uh, shame we don't have that today, but we will learn a lot about uh, immunity. We'll learn a lot about keeping ourselves well, especially in this uh, day and age that we're living in now. So I'm gonna share some slides. Um, here we go, where are we here? Let's go back to the beginning. Here we go. So a little bit about myself to begin with. Um, as Brian said, I'm a medical herbalist. Varsha Sanage is my name. Um, I run a practice called Vanaspati Herbal Medicine. Um, you can save that question for later. What does Vanaspati mean? <laughs> uh, we can answer that later. Uh, but basically, in my clinic, I see patients um, who have had all sorts of health problems, you know, trying to get well um, through conventional medicine, but then they also want to try natural things or they've tried other things and they haven't worked. So they come and see me and I look at the whole body together rather than an individual condition on its own. So um, I've trained at uh, Westminster University uh, with, a, with a degree in herbal medicine. And I'm also a member of the National Institute of Medical Herbalists. I also mentor other herbalists and um, I have also become registrar for new members of the National Institute of Medical Herbalists with their mentoring scheme. So I'm really passionate about making sure that our profession actually thrives and continues because, you know, it is a dying profession, but not many people qualify in herbal medicine. And you may have used herbal medicine yourself in your kitchen or, you know, mom or grandma or somebody in the family will know a little bit about herbs or spices to use in medicine to get well or stay well. Uh, so I want to be hearing a bit about your stories as well. So we'll cover that too. So that's me. Uh, today I'm going to talk about um, herbs with the specific uh, emphasis on teas and tinctures. I know we'll get questions about COVID and immunity in that respect as well. So I'm happy to answer those questions as well a little bit later. Um, so let's carry on. Um, so first I'll talk about the uh, introduction of what herbal medicine is. And then we will cover the top five herbs that I feel are uh, my favorites. Um, I'm happy to talk about others as well. There will be time for others as well. And then I'll talk to you about how we use herbs. So one of the forms we use herbs is teas, another is tinctures. So I'll tell you what, what that means. There are many other ways we use herbs as well. For example, creams or decoctions. Uh, so if you've got questions on those later, feel free to ask. Um, and I've put in a bonus slide about COVID and what I've been doing for some of my patients recently. And uh, a little offer for you to sign up to my newsletter and um, some uh, thing I'm gonna send you as a free gift. Okay. So uh, let's begin. What is a herb? So uh, the definition officially is any plant with leaves, seeds or flowers used for flavoring, food, medicine or perfume. So a lot of herbs are aromatic. 
so that's why they're often used in perfume. But the ar aromas come from essential oils, which have therapeutic benefit to us. Um, but if you think of herbs as just specialised food, then that's a nice way to understand what they what they do because they are just plants, you know, just like your regular uh, broccoli or your regular peppers or carrots. They they are just food, but they're more potent. So we'll go into a bit more about that. So how do they become more potent? They contain plant chemicals. So just like you know that you know your orange contains vitamin C, um, there are lots and lots of other plant chemicals within. Um, herbs and plants and the collective name for that is phytochemicals phyto meaning plant and chemicals is as you know as in the modern word meaning chemistry of chem you know chemicals in the plant or chemicals in a lab or whatever it could be but these are plant ones um, so they have a direct impact on our body so some alternative medicines are very energetic you know they have an energetic effect on the body but herbal medicine actually has a direct impact on your body chemistry so it is very similar to drugs but the difference being that we use whole plants rather than individual chemicals taken out of a plant and that minimizes side effects and in nature um, these chemicals are provided in the plants by Mother Nature, God, whatever you want to believe in, um, that uh, they are provided together because they work together. They have a synergistic action. So, for example, when you have an orange, you know it's got vitamin C, but did you know that the white part has um, bioflavonoids in it, which maximise absorption of vitamin C, but also at the same time buffer it so that it doesn't cause too much acidic uh, reaction in your body so just like that all the plants that we use in herbal medicine they have a multitude of, of plant uh, chemicals that actually interact together to create the, the beautiful healing effect rather than an individual chemical um, so we can use that to bring about positive change in our immune cells so then let's go into a bit more detail. So fruits, vegetables, herbs, spices, all these things have phytochemicals. So there's a range of them. So for example, if you're talking about, um, let's think like cucumber, for example, that would have quite low phytochemicals. It's got lots, but in comparison to a, a strong herb, it's got quite less. So that would come under the low end then you've got more sort of food-based items in the middle, and then you've got herbal tonics. So things that you would class as very nutritious, like um, blackstrap molasses, for example, has quite a lot of um, iron in it, or you might have um, dates or something like that that are quite rich in minerals. So they would be herbal tonics. And then you've got the herbal medicines. And if you go even further and you have plants that have more phytochemicals in them they are toxic plants and in herbal medicine we do use some of those in very small doses there's a thing in the chat uh, okay yeah fantastic we're going to save questions to the end so let's move on so my top five herbs for immunity i love echinacea uh, thyme elder, garlic and reishi. Reishi is a mushroom, which is not strictly a herb, but we do use it in herbal medicine. And I just wanted you to be aware that, you know, some of the mushrooms we use are very, very beneficial for our immunity. So I included that as well. There are many, many other um, immune herbs that can be utilized. We'll talk about a few more uh, if we have time, but these are my top five favorite. So let's dive straight into Echinacea, which a lot of people will have heard of. It's quite a popular herb at the moment, you know, it's, it's got a good reputation. Um, so Echinacea can be two different types. One is Angustifolia we use in herbal medicine and the other is Purpurea. Um, the best herbalists talk about combining the two and mi mixing them. We use the root of this plant, not the flowers. The beautiful flowers are there, yes, but 
we don't use that in herbal medicine. All the good stuff is in the root. Um, and it's a fantastic remedy for immune enhancement in the sense of it covers a whole load of immune um, modulating. So the plant chemicals in there are alkylamides and they create a little tingling sensation when you take this remedy. So the roots, um, either as a dried uh, herb and made into a tea or as a tincture, which is a um, alcoholic extract, they, if it's got good enough amounts of alkylamides in it, then it will cause that tingling sensation in the mouth. If it doesn't, it hasn't got enough and it's not a good quality product. It's the, the taste test. It also um, contains cannabinoids, the same sort of thing that you'd find in cannabis. And within those cannabinoids, there's one particular cannabinoid called anandamide. Um, and anandamide is known as the bliss molecule. So in um, Ayurvedic um, medicine in Sanskrit, we, we talk about anand as in the happiness, like bliss. And that's how it was named. It was discovered by um, somebody who obviously used a Sanskrit word, I'm not sure who. Uh, and they named it anandamide. So when you take echinacea, not only does it give you that feel good factor, um, but it's also you know, helping your immunity. Uh, we call it an immune modulator rather than an immune booster. And the reason for that is that it balances things out. Herbs have this beautiful quality of when things are not in balance, they bring them back to balance. It's also a sialagogue, which means it creates saliva so it's going to help your digestion it's antimicrobial which means it can kill bacteria and bugs uh, it's lymphagog it's it's a lymphagog which means it supports your lymphatic system it's antipyretic which means that it can uh, help you to manage fever and it increases phagocytosis which is where the immune cells come and gobble up like Pac-Man all the waste and the bacteria that shouldn't be there. So it, it cleans up. It cleans up after it helps your immune system to, to clean up. It's not antiviral in itself. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily use it as a number one treatment for a viral situation, but it's generally improving your immune cells from communicating with each other. So it will improve general immune health. Um, it can be used as a prevention and it primes the immune system before an attack occurs. So as, an, as a remedy that to take as a prophylactic, which means as a prevention, is, is a lovely way to, to use echinacea. Often people give it to children. Um, some people take it every year. In the autumn, they start their regime um, and just kind of build their immunity that way. So who would use it? Uh, people with colds, influenza, uh, or as a general tonic we said. Um, if you have an upper respiratory tract infection or sore throat, then it's fantastic for that. Uh, especially a streptococcus infection and swollen lymph glands. It's a really safe herb to take. There is a misconception that you shouldn't take it long term and you can't take it like continuously but actually it is completely safe to do that. And I know somebody who actually researches um, echinacea and is, uh, you know, he's in, a, in Australia, he's, his name's Kerry Bone, a well-known herbalist um, who does research and has his own company making echinacea products. He himself takes echinacea every single day and he has been taking it for 10 years plus. So, and he's quite well, so. <laughs> No, no side effects really. Um, so let's move on to thyme. Thyme is a really easy one to incorporate into your diet and into your lifestyle. And that's why I chose it because you could have a little pot of thyme growing on your windowsill, or you could have dried thyme in your house, in your uh, kitchen cupboard. And it's a, a really easy remedy to use. So I thought, you know, include something that you could probably utilize in your own house. Um, and we use the aerial plant 
uh, aerial parts of this plant, the leaves mainly, but we, we don't individually pick the leaves, we just kind of break off the top part. And then uh, the constituents within there, which is thymol and carvol, which you may have heard of, which are essential oils, they have this wonderful aroma. And that aroma is, is from the essential oils that is antimicrobial. A lot of plants that are um, from the Mediterranean and contain lots of lovely oils like lavender and thyme and uh, sage and th all those kinds of plants will be highly antimicrobial. Um, and they're quite concentrated as well, especially if they are grown in uh, a warm climate and uh, the water content within the plant is less, then it will be more stronger. So a really nice remedy to use, particularly having an affinity for the um, throat. So the flowers, I don't know if you know, are lovely blue colored tiny flowers. And in terms of chakras, the throat is the area that um, is covered by blue, blue color. Um, and the throat chakra is supported by this, this plant. So if you have problems with expression, um, sore throats, not able to um, speak up, then it's a fantastic herb for that. Uh, it's a very, very safe herb. There's no kind of contraindications unless you're using the essential oil. Don't, don't use the essential oil directly on skin. Don't take the essential oil um, internally unless you know what you're doing. Um, but as a plant, it's very, very safe. You can add it to your cooking. You could um, add it to pasta dishes. You could add it into soups and stews and things like that. Or you could make it into a remedy like we're going to talk about a little bit later. And then we have the wonderful elderberry. So they are out at the moment, I think, or maybe the birds have got them now, I don't know. I haven't had a, a look yet. Um, but the Latin name for that is Sambucus nigra, and we use the berries and the flowers. The berries and the flowers both have different properties. So here we're talking mainly about the berries in the autumn and winter time, which are really high in vitamin C and bioflavonoids, which I've forgotten to add on there, but it, it's rich in bioflavonoids. The bioflavonoids are the thing that give give the um, berry that uh, kind of puckering effect when you when you eat it. When you have like white wine, for example, and you get that dryness, it's from the bioflavonoids. Um, and the action that this herb has on the body is that it's diaphoretic, which means that it induces sweating. So in herbal medicine, we like to work with the body rather than against the body. So if someone is having a fever, we want to encourage the fever to take its course. And so we use herbs like um, elderberry to create more sweating and you almost kind of sweating the, the disease out of the body. Um, it is highly antiviral. So Whereas Echinacea was antibacterial, this is antiviral. And you don't get a lot of antiviral medication from GPs or doctors. Um, the, those kinds of antiviral medicines are very, very strong with a lot of side effects. Whereas here in nature, we have a lovely antiviral that is so gentle and safe, you know. Um, it's immune modulating again, and it has a little bit of a diuretic effect, which means that it's... Um, releasing excess water from your body and it's highly antioxidant so antioxidants are things like vitamin c um, and things that actually delay aging and age related illnesses so it's basically stopping um, the slowing down i wouldn't say stopping actually slowing down the aging process so anything that comes with aging, whether it be wrinkles or arthritis or anything like that, it's slowing that down. And we have a lot of things in our environment that speed that up. We have a lot of things that speed up aging, like Wi-Fi, like pollution. Um, obviously, uh, here at London Vegans, we don't eat meat, but you know, things in, in meat products, animal products can speed up aging. Whereas this is an opposite of that and it's um, slowing down the aging process. 
So when would you use this? Uh, really good for colds and flus. It's so safe even for kids. Um, you could use it for cold sores as well because it's antiviral effect on the HPV um, virus. You can use it when someone has fever and you could use it when people have ear infections. So all of that kind of upper respiratory area where things are a bit difficult to shift, antibiotics might not work because it's viral rather than bacterial, then things like elderberry will be fantastic. Um, if you're going to go and pick your own elderberries, be careful where you pick them from. So the reason I say that is two reasons. One is uh, obviously you don't want to be picking elderberries low down where dogs have been. <laughs> and you don't necessarily want to have um, sprayed uh, elderberries. So if they're in your own garden, you know you haven't sprayed them, that's fine. Or pick them from very high up, um, and then that, that way they're going to be a safer bet. Because I have come across cases where people have picked elderberry and then they've become quite sick, uh, vomiting and stuff, when the, the plants have been sprayed with things like roundweed. So just be careful if you are picking your own. Um, but if you want to buy them, you know, that you can buy these things uh, either dried or if you go to farmer's markets, you might be able to get some fresh. Um, yeah, but if, if you can get them free, why not? <laughs> My other most favourite, favourite herb, which is quite smelly, but it does work so wonderfully well for so many things, I have to include it, is garlic. And um, obviously some people don't like it, but uh, it is so helpful in terms of um, immunity in a, in a variety of ways, because not only does it um, help actual immune cells to to thrive but actually it can kill bacteria it can kill viruses it can kill funguses and it can kill parasites so it can do a whole host of things and it it doesn't need to be like you, you don't need to tell it this is the thing you want to kill you know you don't want to um, say to the garlic go and go and deal with my fungus it just deals with everything all in one go so not only that, it's a circulatory stimulant, so it's taking your circulation, your nutrition, your oxygen to all parts of the body and improving that. It is useful for things like um, cholesterol as well. And the other wonderful thing it does in terms of immunity is it breaks down mucus and brings it up. So it's an expectorant. So it's not only making the mucus thinner and easier to cough up, but then you, it helps the coughing up as well. So that you actually clearing your uh, sinuses, any blocked ears, nose, anything like that, where you've got a lot of congestion, it will help with that. Some people have a little bit of um, post-nasal drip after a flu or cold, um, and it can deal with that for you, just kind of get rid of that. So I use it like an antibiotic. Um, so it would be prescribed, if someone's ill, then, then I would prescribe it, you know, a dose every four hours, you know, three to four times a day, religiously for a week to 10 days. And it works wonderfully like that. You know, I've had patients who I've had a chock block diary or something and, and I've said to them, well, just, just take this and we'll review it in a week. And they come back and they say, oh, it's all gone now. <laughs> So I think, okay, that's brilliant, you know, and they're really happy. So do do consider garlic as, as one of the things that you use as a medicine. It's rich in a constituent called allicin and sulfur as well. And there were some studies done that said that the allicin content increased if you chopped the garlic and left it for about five minutes before you took it. So the actual action of breaking it down and the cells kind of reacting to the breakdown of chopping uh, invokes the response to from the garlic to produce more allicin so it converts alanin into allicin or the other way around I can't remember to be honest my chemistry is not brilliant um, so the active constituent is even higher when you just chop it up leave it for five minutes and then add it to your cooking or to have it raw or to put it on maybe um, like a garlic bread 
that you might be making so that's a nice way to get garlic into kids um so yeah lovely lovely way to take this it's enjoyable as well if, if you like the garlic taste so where would you use this colds and flu as we said but also things like bronchitis the deeper infections so before we were talking about respiratory infections in the nose and the throat and, and the upper respiratory tract, this can help also the deeper in infections like bronchitis. Um, I've even helped somebody with pneumonia with garlic, um, chest infections as, of any sort, sinusitis and catarrh, as we were saying, like a post-nasal drip. Some people don't tolerate it well. If you've got um, gut issues, you might find it irritant to the gut. So start on a small amount if you've not tried garlic before and see how you are and then gradually increase. And obviously there is the, the major side effect of having garlic breath. But the cure to that is give it to everybody in the family. Then you're all the same. <laughs> Okay, so uh, how am I doing for time? Uh, yeah, so I'm on time. Okay, so the other one I wanted to talk about is Ganoderma. You may know it as reishi, which is a mushroom. Uh, it's a beautiful color mushroom. And we use the fruiting body of this. It's rich in something called uh, beta-glucans which are known now uh, from scientific research that they actually help to boost your immune system. Um, they are complex sugars in effect. So they do have kind of a sugar high effect, but actually because they're complex, it's a slow release, like, like having um, wholemeal bread rather than having like a white bread. So they work very slowly in increasing your energy and give you stamina which is what you need when you're not feeling very well. Um, they also contain bitter resins and triterpenes and sterols that act as precursors to hormone production. So the hormones that we're talking about are things like cortisol, which is a stress hormone. Because um, I know when we say hormone, people think, you know, uh, sexual hormones, but there are other types of hormones like insulin is a hormone. Um, cortisol is a hormone so all these things and you have hormones produced in your gut for digestion as well so it helps with all of these so it's giving you an overall wellness thing um, and we call it an adaptogen when it's like this when it's an overall wellness thing that helps you to cope better with stress and it helps your immune system to cope better with whatever is attacking it then that's called an adaptogen. It's not a specific action. It's a, a overall full body uh, action to Im uh, improve your overall well-being. So, yeah, as it says, it lowers cortisol. It helps to make new white blood cells and it activates the immune cells in preparation to attack. So a really, really good remedy to have in your arsenal against flus and colds and these kinds of things. Uh, it's fantastic for the lower respiratory tract inf uh, infections as well. Uh, I think I might have spelt that wrong, sorry. It's talking about lower respiratory tract infections and lower urinary tract infections as well. Yes, it does, yes. So it helps in other types of infections as well. So when we've been talking a lot about respiratory, but it can help with other infections as well and it's helping you to build resistance. Um, in rare cases, it can cause liver toxicity. There's been one or two cases like that in the uh, scientific journals, um, but whether that was definitely this particular mushroom they took, we don't know. So just be sure about identification, be sure about what you're buying. Um, if you need help with that, then you know herbalists like myself or contacting a herbalist near you through the National Institute of Medical Herbalists can help you to uh, make sure you're making the right decision there. Okay, so now we're going to talk about teas. Okay, so what is a tea? Seems like a very simple question, right? <laughs> but um, the dis difference between a tea and some other forms of herbal medicine 
is that this is a very simple way of using um, plants to heal yourself. So you basically have an infusion where you have the plant material, you add hot water and you steep it for a set amount of time, maybe five to ten minutes. It's not very long at all. Um, you extract water soluble constituents only from that um, method of um, having a herbal medicine. Um, and the types of plants we would use or part parts of plants we would use are the flowers, the leaves, the petals, all the soft bits of a plant would be used to make a tea. So for example, elderflower is a, a really good example, nettle or chamomile, these are very, very easy herbal teas to make. It would not extract any um, fat soluble or alcohol soluble um, chemicals within the plant. So remember we were talking about plant chemicals, phytochemicals that are um, uh, varied in, in all plants. So for example, in the chamomile, you will get the water soluble parts this way, but you won't get the oil soluble ones, the fat soluble ones. You won't get the uh, stronger things like the resins uh, that you would have to extract through alcohol, you know. So it depends what you need. And that's why we have a variety of ways of making herbal remedies. But teas are a really good way to start your herbal journey. I would encourage you to use um, good quality loose leaf um, or loose petals and loose uh, flowers that rather than tea bags um, because tea bags often do contain a lot of chemicals um, bleach and stuff like that there are some really good companies so look out for the ones that are like bleach free or um, made from recycled uh, paper and things like that so do, do look out or you can have uh, cloth ones as well made of cotton um, but if you use loose leaf ones and you can put them into a cafetiere like this it just becomes a very lovely treat it becomes very special um, or you could use those uh, tea balls that you can dip into a mug uh, and it's a lovely way to start your herbal tea journey if you'd like to buy any herbal teas then let me know as well uh, if you want to buy loose ones and a tincture a tincture is um, an extract uh, using alcohol. So there are stronger things in plants that sometimes can't be extracted through water or through oil or fat. So then we use alcohol and that extracts so much more. Sometimes it's even double extracted. So sometimes we have water based extraction and we have alcohol based extraction from the same plant material and then it's combined to make a remedy. So that becomes a lot more complex. Um, but this is a straightforward uh, alcohol extraction. So basically you get plant matter, say for example, you're using nettle, you just get a load of nettles, you put that into a jar, you add um, an alcohol, a pure alcohol like vodka, you leave it for a while, like a week to 10 days. Uh, some people leave it longer, like even a month, depending on what we're trying to extract and what plant it is and how tough it is. For example, if it's a really tough root, then you might need to leave it longer. And there's a whole science to all of that, but I'm showing you the, the folk method, the, the method you could use at home. So you could just put some herbs into the jar, add your vodka and leave it for a while. And then just stir it every, every day a little bit. Um, after 10 days, a week, two weeks, whatever you want to leave it, then you just strain away all the plant matter and the liquid that you're left with is this um, lovely tincture. And it's extracted all the goodness from the plant and that can then be taken in the body in small doses. So you don't need a lot with tinctures. You literally need um, like teaspoons worth or sometimes if it's very strong, even just drops, drop doses. So it depends on the herb, depends on how strong the alcohol is, depends what you're trying to extract. So it's quite a complex thing to make them, but uh, you, could, you could do a basic one at home and a lot of people do do that. So it's worth trying. If you try it, let me know. Uh, the good thing about tinctures is that they last a long time. So, you know, a tincture that you've made today can still be valid for you to use in the springtime 
Uh, and that's the beauty of the fact that when we dry herbs or we make them into tinctures, we can utilize them throughout the whole year. So for example, elderflower is only available in the spring. So, and, it, and we know it's really good for uh, things like fever, but most people get fever in the winter. So we dry it all and we keep it and then we can use it or we make it into a tincture. So some of you may have heard of echinacea tincture. And this is my bonus slide. So I knew that we would get questions on where can I buy things? I knew we would get questions on uh, COVID. Um, so this is not a surefire thing that it will help prevent COVID. This is a recipe that I've used based on a lot of herbalists who've come together at the beginning of coronavirus. And we have come up with this these kinds of herbs and these kinds of formulas. And this is my particular formula for this particular person that I used it for. And it's a mixture of tinctures um, designed to uh, support the lungs in preparation for having COVID, in preparation that you will inevitably get COVID. So we can't say that we can definitely prevent it. We can't say that we can definitely cure it. What we can say is that if you get it, you can have the best outcome possible by supporting your lungs. So we have this wonderful inula in here. Inula is um, uh, a herb that warms the lungs. It's very specific for the lungs. Then we have the reishi that we talked about earlier, which is the mushroom one. We have astragalus, which is a Chinese remedy that's uh, been known to uh, support immune immunity. And we have scutellaria and rhodiola and angelica. Those are fantastic remedies for the cilia in the nose and the throat and the lungs, which are the tiny hair-like structures that prevent things from getting into your lungs. And also when things are in your lungs that need to be out, they create a wave-like action to push things out. So in COVID, what happens is people find it difficult to cough things out. And the reason for that is COVID destroys your cilia. So we want to maximize the cilia and th that's what these remedies do here. And then we've got thyme and glycerizer is uh, licorice. So thyme we talked about and licorice is a demulcent. Demulcent means it's very soothing, it's antiviral, um, and it soothes, soothes the, the throat, especially, and inside the lungs, makes everything smooth. So it's a very nice kind of remedy in terms of how it works. In taste, it's disgusting. <laughs> um, but you, you need to take it if you want to prevent. I, I've been taking it. A lot of my patients have been taking it regularly. Uh, not necessarily in these doses. Uh, this is a particular dosage for one particular person. So we'd vary the dose depending on the person, the size, their weight, what else is going on in their life. You know, for example, if they're a very stressed person, we might put in an adaptogen. If they're very, um, if they have asthma, for example, as well, then we might put in some more lung support a bit more. Um, if they've already got a cough or, you know, prone to um, swollen glands, then we might put some other things in like echinacea. So it depends. We, we vary it and we make it very bespoke to the person. So some of the things that, other things I've been using is um, this pre-lung infection mix that I've just told you about. The echinacea tincture, the elderberry tincture, and the thyme and licorice syrup. Uh, and we also um, make a lovely wild cherry syrup, which is anti-cough, um, anti I should say. I'm not going to use the jargon. Uh, and I make a lovely flu tea that brings about um, a faster recovery from fever and colds and flus by inducing sweating. So we make, make all those kinds of uh, remedies on a regular basis. So that's kind of it really, but I wanted to leave quite a lot of time for questions. And I have some other slides that uh, we could refer to regarding uh, your questions as well. So I'm just going to stop sharing for a moment. 
Brian, did you want to yeah. ask about the questions or shall... Uh, thank you, Varsha, ever so much. Um, yeah, if people have got questions, they can either, um, should be able to raise their hand on the, uh, somewhere on this system, I think under the chat box, I believe, um, or you can post a question in the chat box uh, to me, or if you put your physical hand up, I should be able to see you and you'll then need, need to unmute yourself. Um, just while people are doing that, see if there's any questions, I just wanted to, if, if you actually say, um, maybe the two or three minutes, um, you know, people obviously have heard from you about the various herbs. If you'd like just to give a little bit of a sell as to why somebody should go to the herbalist rather than just going to Waitrose and buying a packet of Echinacea tea. Would you mind sort yeah. of focusing on that aspect? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if you go to um, buy a ready-made product, then it's going to be an extract to a standardized amount. Um, so that means it's had something tampered on, on that product. You know, it's, it's not just the plain herb. It's been tampered with and chemicals have been extracted to make sure that it has the right amount of chemicals in it. So that in itself is not holistic. Um, so then there'll be things missing. If they're taking out certain amounts of things and making sure that they're of that same quantity in each tablet, then, you know, other things are going to be missing. So I've used this vitamin C example again, that if you wanted vitamin C and you wanted exactly 1,000 milligrams and you want to take it from oranges, then you're going to remove all the bioflavonoids because you want it to be as strong as possible in vitamin C. So you're missing out on something. Some people say the opposite. They say it's really important to know exactly how much of something you're taking. Mm. But in herbal medicine, we don't believe that. We believe that taking it in its most natural form is going to be more potent because of the other things that are with it. So even if you took 500 milligrams of vitamin C, but it had the bioflavonoids with it, it's going to be more potent than a thousand milligrams. So similarly, the chemicals within echinacea, for example, um, that you buy at the shops will be uh, probably less because they're going to standardize the alkylamides, which is what the research is done on. Um, and research is done in a very strange way. You know, they, they follow the same methods as drug research. Whereas herbs just don't work like that. They're using the wrong type of research on herbs. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't. It's not the same. You know, it, you can't use exact, precise measurements with herbs. Uh, in fact, you know, if you grow thyme in your garden and I grew thyme on my windowsill, it'll have totally different amounts of chemical constituents in it. And somebody else grew it in Spain, it'll have different constituents in it, even if it's from the same plant. Because of the soil, the how it's watered, what amount of sun it's had, all sorts of things come into play. If it's been attacked by bugs, then it will produce more good chemicals to protect itself. So there's many factors to consider. So that's one reason. The other reason is that um, if you're talking about tea bags, for example, then they're going to be such a tiny amount per bag. So you're just not getting enough of the herb if you want to use it as a medicinal. If you want it as a just nice flavoured drink, then that's fine. But if you're taking it as a medicinal, you need a lot more. Um, how long those, tab those uh, tea bags have sat on the shelf? No idea. Um, what else? The bags, the tea bags themselves is an issue with um, how they are made and what they're made of. There's been a lot of research recently uh, into plastics. You know, if you go even to local kind of cafes, you'll find all the tea bags are made of plastic. So you've got to be careful of that. How much plastics are you taking in? And plastics have a big impact on our hormonal system. So that's quite an important factor. Um, what else is there? Uh, radiation so some of them get radiated to prevent them having bugs in them they don't even have to tell us that um, so there's a lot of reasons but that doesn't mean I don't use over-the-counter products myself you know sometimes you do need to use them um, sometimes I have patients who don't want to take alcohol 
who don't want to make teas because they're working in an environment where they can't sit down and have a cup of tea or have kitchen facilities or anything. So then you go for tablets, you know, you go for the next best thing, you buy the product off the shelf and, and do it that way. Or I make capsules, vegetarian capsules um, of the herbs, I grind the herbs up and, and make them into capsules. So I make like turmeric capsules or milk thistle capsules or echinacea root capsules. Um, so that's a nice way of doing it as well. You could make your own or you could just take the powder. Herbal medicine is so uh, versatile. So you can take it in all sorts of ways. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I've got a question that says, uh, this is from uh, Sandra. I'm wondering if Farsha has seen the University of Freiburg study, which shows that dandelion leaf stops the spike poke protein in SARS-CoV-2 from adhering to the ACE2 receptors. I've, I've read about that, yes. Um, comment? That's not, <laughs> that's not the be all and end all. You know, to me, immunity is about um, starting at the barriers first. So that's something I would like to share with you, actually, uh, if I can share my slides again. Uh, let's go back to slideshow. So this is another uh, thing I did. So barrier immunity is the number one thing you need to think about. Uh, what I mean by that is, you know, we have by nature been provided with lots of barriers to prevent infection getting in. So points of invasion are what we need to protect. Things like your skin, your mucous membranes and the cilia that I was talking about, the tiny hair-like structures. Make sure they're good and strong. Make sure that um, your salivary enzymes are good and you're hydrated. Make sure your stomach acid is there because you know if you eat something with a virus on it or a bacteria on it, your stomach acid will neutralize it. So just prevent this from getting into your system in the first place. And then things like dandelion are fantastic as well. You know, you can always incorporate, they're so easily obtainable. You can incorporate that into your diet. And if it's part of your kind of daily routine, then you're going to be fine, you know, as a prevention. Um, so these are some of the other defenses. Uh, I think that's getting a bit complex now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, um, yes. Paul Campbell. Paul, you've raised your hand. You've got a question for us. Yeah, I put it in the text there. Um, it's just I know this trained and experienced herbalist who lives close to me in County Clare in Ireland, and she mentioned that Google doesn't facilitate the Latin names of plants very well. That's, that's, for example, if you Google the Latin name of a plant, uh, Google's not that accurate. Or it could be that she meant that if you if you Google the daily use name of the plant to get the Latin name, it's it's not that accurate either. Uh, so from what I understand, it, from what she was saying, is that Google is not that compatible with the Latin name of plants. I just wondered if, if Farsha has come across that. Um... Yeah, keeping up with that is a big, big job. And I think botanists uh, would agree with me, p people who are into gardening and, and are very much into, you know, purebred plants and things like that. Um, names of plants are changing constantly. They rename things all the time. Uh, so keeping up to date with that is very, very difficult. Um, and if you, for example, used... Um, there's many plants that have the first name as the same and the second name is slightly different. So that's quite important. You know, it's like, you know, Brian Jacobs. If, if I think, OK, I want to meet Brian Jacobs and I just go by Brian and then I think, OK, Brian Smith is OK. It's yeah. not the same person. So yeah. you have to have the right name of the plant. So this is another key reason why you need to be careful what you're buying and what you're picking um, identification is absolutely essential, um, which is why I use um, GMP certified uh, suppliers who check not only that the product is exactly as it's meant to be, they actually physically take samples of it and analyze it under a microscope. Um, they check that it hasn't got any other plant mixed in with it. 
it hasn't got any bacteria or um, any other pollutants with it. They check for things like um, uh, lead, arsenic, and um, lead, arsenic, and the other one I forget. Uh, another toxic chemical. Uh, they check for pesticides. So try and go for organic as much as you can because you know if you're giving yourself a herb for healing, there's no point having toxins in there as well. So that's really important. You know, it's a person who's not very well will not handle toxins. You know, you, they're already unwell. Their livers and their t uh, detoxification organs are already under burden. You don't want to tax them even more. So organic is always best if you can you yeah. know, go for that. Um, sometimes I think if it's not organic, don't do it because adding more toxins is worse than not doing anything at all. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, any other questions? Am I over the out there? Whilst that's happening, I just wondered, is there a way of, I mean, I'll say a way of, but if you're having um, a mixture of herbs and, and you say some of them don't taste so good, does it destroy the effect if you add in some maple syrup or agave syrup or something to make it taste more palatable? Yeah, um, I see John's got his hand up, so we'll see okay. you soon, yeah. Don't worry, John, we yeah. can you. <laughs> um, so some herbs, if you are taking them to, for example, lower blood sugar, then you do need to taste the bitterness. In fact, they found uh, recently that you have bitter receptors in your lungs and they don't know why. So, you know, the, the human body is remarkable. I, we, we don't understand it fully, but, you know, it makes sense that if there are bitter receptors in your lungs, at some point you're meant to kind of utilize them. So to taste bitters lowers your blood sugar. It, it creates a cascade of, of chemical events mm -hmm. in your body that, allow that to happen so if you think okay i'm taking this herbal remedy it's bitter it's meant to lower my blood sugar but i'll just add some honey because it don't taste so good so <laughs> it's just not going to work or if you take it as a capsule a lot of people do that some of these bitter herbs that are for lowering blood sugar they take them as capsules that doesn't work so sometimes you know capsules are not a good idea so it's, it just depends on the individual use why are you using it but otherwise yeah it's still a chemical going into your body so if it's meant to have an action further down in your body then yes it's going to work so the other so the answer is um, drink it and put up with it is that me yeah. <laughs> okay uh, thanks uh, john you have a question yeah yeah sorry thank you yeah um you talk about the tea bags and um, it'll get out the water soluble elements that you want. Mm -hmm. But there's probably other stuff in there which isn't water soluble, which is good. So would there be any benefit once you've drunk the tea, the, either the tea bag or the tea infusion, to actually eat, this, eat the leaves? Because yes. it might sound odd, but I do, when I have a, if I use green tea and I have a drink of green tea, I open up the tea bag afterwards and I you know, chuck the, uh, the tea leaves in my mouth. And I'm sure there's some goodness in them. Definitely. What would you say? I have a few patients who do that. Um, one religiously does that. She actually adds it to stews and things like that and cooks it. Uh, mm. So she doesn't want to waste it. If you're really not up for eating that kind of stuff, because it isn't very nice tasting, it's chewy or it's um, a bit flowery, you know, then put it on the compost heap because it's so nutritious. At least you're getting some benefit, you know, for your growth of whatever plants you're going to grow next. So definitely, it's so nutritious. There's so much in there still. Yeah. Definitely. Good. All right. Thank you. Good question. Interesting. Um, any other questions? I said you can just uh, send me a message or raise your hand physically, or in which case, if you need to, if you're doing it physically, then you need to show me your picture. I think maybe you again, John, and somebody else has got their hand up. Go for it, John. Yeah. Um, you mentioned garlic. And various other things earlier what if they're cooked for instance if you go and have a, a pizza and pizza hut and you can you choose what you want in they got ones with your garlic in it yeah as the cooking process that pizza hut might use but does it um, render the garlic not so much so much good or is it still it. good 
yes, definitely it would lower the, some of the potency, but it's still good for you in terms of prevention. If you're trying to use it as a medicine, then no, it's not going to be as potent. So it's depending on what you want to get out of it. So if you're just having it in your daily diet as a regular thing that you want to include to make sure that your immunity is up to scratch and you don't necessarily have any particular health issues that you're trying to fight, then it's sufficient, yes. So yep. just include lots of herbs and spices and teas and things like that in your diet. You know, throw in some thyme, throw in some basil, throw in some... Um, sage into your cooking and just utilize all the herbs and spices that you have to your hand you know I put things like turmeric in my pasta sauces um, you can put other powdered herbs into hummus um, you can put adaptogens into hummus Lo lovely adaptogen herbs that are things like ginseng powders and um, ashwagandha powders and stuff like that you can put them into hummus and you'll never taste them and they taste great you just you're getting your nutrition and you're getting your boost of energy uh, and immunity without uh, really having to taste that bad so there are trip tips and tricks of using we, we use these kinds of tips for children really but yeah you can utilize those tricks as well um, and some herbal remedies are even tasty so we have talked about horrible tasting ones but some are very tasty like blueberry jam mm. very good for your veins um, or uh, and also very high in uh, uh, vitamin C, for example, or bioflavonoids. You can make a jam out of the elderberries. You could make an elderberry syrup. You could make uh, elderflower champagne. There's you know lots of nice tasting herbal remedies too. And the, the same applies for the the cooking the garlic. If if you have some time and you put it in your cooking, then again it may lessen the effect of, of the time yeah. Isn't it? yeah so with the, those kind of aromatic herbs it's better to have them dried because the yeah. water content is not there so the active constituents are more potent so when you add them to your food you're actually getting more of the active constituents yeah, yeah. Note to that. good um any herbs you'd like to ask about that i haven't covered oh hello nilam hi um can you i i know the gujarati name for the herb so if if it's possible for you to answer the question it's called karvo limudu that's neem is it neem yeah so how uh, how is it beneficial for you so neem is a very bitter herb again uh, very good for insulin resistance and sugar control and the reason sugar control is really important in immunity is that sugars uh, lower your immunity. If you have high sugar in your diet, it's almost like um, going back to science in school, um, osmosis, you know, the, the, the water leaves the body, the, leaves the cells from an area of um, high concentration to low concentration or the other way around. I can't remember. <laughs> um, so basically your cells become dehydrated because water is leaving them. And this is the same case with things like high salt diets and high sugar diets. So the water is leaving those cells, they're not able to function well. So your immunity goes down. So that's why it's important to make sure that your blood sugars are not you know, all over the place. They've got to be on an even keel. And neem does that, it lo lowers your blood sugar levels. It's also um, antifungal, so it's very good for uh, infections uh, externally, like on the skin or on the scalp, um, eczema, lice, um, that kind of thing, you know, scalp infections as well. That's what I've kind of used it for. Did you have any other use for it, Neelam? Um, no, I just wanted to ask, would it be okay to use with a smoothie? Yeah. Because it's quite right bitter, there. isn't it? Yeah, it's very bitter. You might not like it. I would only put a tiny amount, maybe one liter. Yeah. Yeah. See how you feel. Because it's going to work on your liver. Any bitter herb works on your liver. So it will so, increase. So having it in the smoothie is a good idea, would you say? Yeah, yeah you can do okay. it. Okay. 
Yeah. Okay. Put all sorts of things in smoothies and hide the taste, right? Yeah. <laughs> but mainly for that. <laughs> yeah, but you can make um a bathing infusion with this as well. Yeah. So anybody with skin infections can kind of put all the leaves into a bathtub and make a huge bathtub infusion and then sit in it and it helps to um, get rid of fungal infections. But we mostly use it, you know, after delivery or if someone has had chicken pox or something. Yeah. And you put it under the uh, mattress, uh, not under the mattress, but under the sh bed sheet. Okay. Yeah. I heard that, no. Yeah. I, I, I remember I we used to, to do it. You, um, do you, in your families, do you have anybody who... Uh, kind of knows all these recipes. Do you remember any treatments that you've had as a child through sort of home remedies? Do oh, share. Yeah. Yeah. I, my mom used to be a good herbalist, sort of, <laughs> because we've never been, I mean, we haven't had uh, many um, um, medicines as such. And also my children hardly ever had, had medicine. Because uh, like if they had a cold or a cough coming up, I would use um, um, basil, the Indian basil. Holy basil, yeah. Yeah, and with it, I would put uh, some uh, ginger, mm -hmm. uh, maybe clove and uh, cinnamon and a bit of jaggery and water and just boil it and then just give it to them to sip every now and then and that they would just recover from the colds and flus very quickly. Lovely. So what you're saying to me is the holy basil, which is a respiratory herb anyway, it's from the mint yeah. family, is going to support the lungs. You've got ginger to increase circulation to all parts of the body and warm the body. You've got clove, which is antiviral, and you've got cinnamon, which is sugar balancing. Perfect. Yeah. Handy. And this jaggery as well, which has and lots of minerals. That has minerals and it has lots of uh, iron in particular as one of the yeah. main minerals. So that's boosting energy as well. So when you're feeling yeah. unwell, you obviously your energy dips. So it boosts you back up again. Yeah, yeah that's a lovely remedy. Anybody else have any remedies from their childhood or their use re recently? Maybe not. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm due to be winding up. I've got a couple of so I've got a couple of the questions, but I think they're quite specific. Are, are they are, are you okay for people to message you privately? Would that be okay, yeah, Varsha? That's fine. Um, rather I than my email. Um, yeah. Have you got Have you got your slide from before that you can put up with your web address and the the um, newsletter? Yeah. If you could bring that up again. There we go. We can take there a screenshot. So in purple at the bottom is my email. Sorry, my website. And that has links to my phone number, my email, everything. Yeah. So if, if I so said there's a couple of specific questions, I think they may rather than sort of general immunity, I think maybe best if they're interested, if they contact you direct, if they're yeah. interested. Um, for those in uh, the Harrow area, we Varsha runs Harrow Health Matters, um, which is a Facebook group. Um, for those interested, do have a look on Facebook uh, for that group and join if you're interested in um, issues relating to your health. Um, I just can say a very big thank you to Varsha for presenting today. Very informative indeed. Um, I've learned a lot. I'm going to look out for particularly, I think, echinacea and thyme. I'm not sure about the garlic and the... Um, the mushroom one, but anyway. Um, okay. There'll be another one for you then. Okay, Maybe. something that's not too too bad in the taste. Yeah, there'll be others. So you've got to find your remedies, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Try um, some different ones. Um, if I could just, oh, sorry, just bear with me a moment. Um, yeah, if you want mind just unmuting yourselves, hopefully you're able to do that, and just give a round of applause for Varsh, I'd appreciate. Oh, thank you. If I can give, I'll give a... Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you guys actually. Um it's always, you know, in person obviously is better, but yeah, yeah. yeah, it's good that we're connecting again. Yeah. Yeah.
Okay, I'm just going to stop the presentation just for a moment. Uh,